Welcome, thanks for joining us. This is our embouchure checkup and warm up. Um, we hope this will be a sort of a spontaneous and interactive session. So if you want to get your clarinets out and your reeds and your mouthpieces, I welcome you to, to kind of try with us. Or you can do what I'm doing, which is since my clarinet's being worked on right now, <laughs> you can get out the old barrel and mouthpiece. You can do this with your mouthpiece alone, but it's a little less obnoxious with the barrel as well. And uh, we're doing this a little spontaneously. We, by we, I mean the pedagogy of the ICA, the pedagogy committee. And then we have several fantastic university professors here. Um, sorry, I'm scooching away from the microphone too much. Uh, I am Dr. Stacy DePaulo. I teach at Southwestern Oklahoma State. Um, we have Pam Schuler here from Eastern New Mexico University. Uh, Dr. Gardner from Arizona State, Ozzy Molina from Alabama, Alabama, Alabama State, and back there ducking behind the podium is Corey Mackey from TCU, TCU Texas Christian University. Um, so I suspect that we may have five different approaches to embouchure which you know you can never hear it in too many different ways so um, we're going to start by asking for a volunteer is there someone who would love to come up great thank you come on up ah uh, okay well we have a, a curveball already oh. this is a double lip on the sure awesome. uh, this is um I, I'll go out and say it, maybe not the most standard um, embouchure, um, but it is a, a wonderful embouchure, and um, if, we're going to start with Dr. Gardner here, um, once you're all ready. Can you tell us your name? Oh, yeah, I'm Josephine. Josephine, and where are you studying at college right now? Yeah, or? I'm um, with Dr. Sunshine Simmons at the University of North Florida. At the University of North Florida, so thank her for volunteering. <laughs> and take your time, get your read set up, and, um, and everybody. Um, I think everybody's adjusting to the read situation. Yes, here. yes. <laughs> yeah, high altitude. Unless so. you're from here, it seems pretty different from. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll let you all deal with this, but if you all want to squeak away a little bit as we're trying things, feel feel free to uh, try out your embouchures as we talk about this. But Dr. Gardner, it's all yours. Okay, so my name is Josh Gardner. I teach at, at Arizona State University. Uh, you know, embouchures like it, it's our interface with the instrument, right? It's such a critical uh, a critical element of of playing the clarinet, and you know, as, as Stacy was mentioning, there are a lot of different ways to do it. We all probably have different approaches, so uh, I'll just kind of go through what I do and some tricks and tips for getting things where they need to be, things to look out for, and uh, common problems we'll try not to take too much time. But um, I, I teach and I play with a, an embouchure where the corners come in rather than out where you have like an ooh position. And I like using a, uh, a, little, a little trick for achieving this, this formation. And anybody can do it. Take your finger. Point it at yourself. Open your mouth just a little bit. Stay relaxed. Put your finger on your top teeth, not under, but on, like this. And notice I'm keeping my lips nice and relaxed. I can still talk. This is very awkward, but you know, we're making it work. Now I want you to push down on your finger with your upper lip without closing your mouth. Your corners come in, your chin flattens, and your bottom lip is nice and firm. Try not to, to close your mouth because that, that can make some other things happen. So did that work for you? Yeah. Great. Okay. So just put your finger on your teeth. Push, oh, look at that. <laughs> like, take a picture of that and put it in a book. That's a good idea. It is. It is a. It is a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful planet on sure, where the top lip is doing what it needs to do, so that the bottom lip, lip can do what it needs to do. We often don't think about the top lip. We're all we're concerned about the bottom lip because that's you know that's where you know 
That's where all the action's happening, right? It's, you know, it's up against the reed, but that's where we also have a lot of the problems. Focusing on the top lip can absolutely help. So why don't, why don't we all try that again, and then, and then we'll switch over to the instrument. So finger, point, hello, on the teeth, push down, not too hard. Keep your mouth open. Corner should be in, upper lip is still firm, and don't go overboard. I see some people flexing. <laughs> I know we're clearing up with this, but you know, not too much. Okay, now let's try it with the, with the, the instrument. And you can like try it like on a low C or an open G or something. So, if you want to remind yourself the, the finger test, try it again. And mouth piece in, and I want you to push down on the top of the mouthpiece with your upper lip. Not too hard. And the horn should feel very stable. It should feel very stable in the mouth. It shouldn't be moving around at all. The muscles should be engaged all around the mouthpiece. When the upper lip is not doing its job, the bottom lip is stuck with too much work. And we often compensate with the jaw. And that's when we start biting. And that's one of the things that double lip can, can help alleviate because if you've never tried double lip and you're a biter, you will quickly stop biting. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> because it is not pleasant. So uh, let's all try it one more time. Maybe a different note. If you played open G, play low C. Okay? So we do a little test. Get down. Got a nice clarinet on sure. And Good. Does the instrument feel stable in your mouth? And so that highlights another point. Your right thumb, believe it or not, is part of your embouchure. Because without it, this is not going to be sufficient, right? So we always want to have a little upward snug of the mouthpiece into the, into the top teeth or the top lip, <laughs> not too much, <laughs> so that the instrument feels stable. You should be able to play without the horn feeling like it's going to fall out of your mouth, right? And I, I, am, a, I am a neck strap user. I am an advocate of neck, of neck straps because my hands are really, like, my hands are really long, my thumb is long, and that leverage just really puts a lot of strain on my hand. Uh, so if you know you're working with your students and, and, and there's some issues with that, then an extra might be something worth considering. I'm an advocate for it. I know not everybody else is, but you know there are plenty of ways to do this. I'm going to stop talking now and pass pass it on. So can, can, does anybody have any questions about this? Okay, great. So to go off of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm dealing with a little chest cold. It's not COVID, I promise. Um, um, to go off of what he was saying, um, um, I'm also a big advocate of bringing the corners in. Um, what he used with the top lip and the right thumb, I talk to my students about that constantly. Kind of thinking of your embouchure as a wedge and that thumb kind of pushes up against that top tooth. Another thing that I found to be really helpful for some of my students, and there's so many walls here, is, and we don't have to do this right now, but if you get up and you go in front of a wall and you put your bell in front of the wall and push up against it, you feel a little bit extra pressure on your top tooth. And what that does is that, again, alleviates some of the pressure off of the bottom part of the reed. So experiment with that on your own, find a wall, and add a little bit of that extra thumb pressure against the wall. You'll feel that pressure on your top tooth, and you hear the reed kind of start to free up a little bit. It's something that I say in my, stu in my lesson with students all the time, is um, allow the reed to vibrate. I require everyone to get that tattoo when they start studying with me. <laughs> right here, it's a great example. Um, and another thing I found with students of all ages is um, the amount of mouthpiece to put in the mouth. I found more often with younger students, because they have smaller mouths, they just don't have enough mouthpiece in the mouth. Can you let this um, So if here's your reed vibrating, here's the mouthpiece, the mouthpiece is with your reed and then it opens up a little bit, right? So it's that breaking point right here where the mouthpiece and the reed kind of converge from each other. And if you have your lips here, then only that part of the mouthpiece. So I'm going to play as loud as I can, and I'm not going to take in very much mouthpiece. I'm putting as much 
much air as possible in there, and, I'm, and I have to clamp down just to get anything by putting a little bit more mouthpiece in the mouth with the thumb. The reed, you allow the reed to vibrate. Now, if you go too much, the clarinet's going to tell you. That's when we get those little squeaks, right? So if you go too much, it'll tell you. Back it off a little bit. Um, I found this to be uh, especially helpful with the bass clarinets, right? Any of the larger reeded instruments. Most students don't have nearly enough mouthpiece in the mouth when they're trying to play bass. So um, I found that that helps a little bit and kind of experimenting with that. Shall we um, let everyone give it a try and find the squeak point? Yeah, let's try it. Like put too much in and let's find where that together. squeak point is. <laughs> for the most squeaks. I think we all just did it. <laughs> that was nice. So then back it off just a little bit and try it again. And then let's add a little bit, a little bit more air once you find that, find that right sweet spot using all the techniques that we just talked about with Dr. Gary. Try it more time. Um, that's okay. It's something for you to experiment with it. Um, again, allowing the reed to vibrate. This helps that a lot. All right. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. We love that you're here and that we're online and this is a terrific thing. So thanks for supporting this event today. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit, very briefly, about double lip embouchure. Um, some, of it, we, some of us have heard of this and you know it's sort of a mystery to some and not obviously it's not a mystery to you because you're living the mystery right now but um for some of us especially of a certain generation it was a more common thing to see essentially what a double lip embouchure is in its most simplistic form is if you could imagine a double reed player an oboist or a bassoonist where they have the lips both lips over their teeth and then the instrument is inserted in as opposed to us, which we have our single lip embouchure. That is sort of the, the basic definition of what a double lip embouchure is, right? Um, it tends to be a little, um, I think the thing that puts people off to a double lip embouchure is that the beginning stages of it, if you're not used to doing it, it places a, an extreme demand on the upper lip in terms of um, stamina, um, and there's a certain amount of discomfort. Some of us would say that there's a certain amount of pain. Some of us would say there's a certain amount of searing pain that runs through your body, right? And this is one of these things that happens. Essentially, a quick way to sort of do this, um, I, had a, I had a teacher who played double lip, and she would um, often talk about, uh, you take your thumb, and you sort of put it on your, you can all join me while we do this. You take your thumb, and there are some people that say that you're supposed to, that you're supposed to put as much upper lip o over your over your top teeth as possible and then there's a sort of school that says you take the very bare minimum of lip to get over those teeth to then to create this this embouchure right i think that is personal preference for a lot of us some of us put more bottom lip in the mouth than others and that's a thing that you have to figure out on your own a few years ago i decided i i have a sort of not typical embouchure and so I thought you know my teacher plays double lip I should switch because she sounds great and I want to sound like her and, and she's like no nah, what you have is fine but I decided to sort of incorporate it into my playing in so much as just to avoid biting the big benefit of double lip embouchure is that it it does not allow the jaw to clamp in such a way that it, that it makes the jaw pain right and the benefits of double lip are also you know, the cavity is more open, the sound is more resonant, right? And if you can maintain your tongue position in that relative high position that we like to promote, it's a wonderful thing for um, creating stamina. Some people say that your legato is improved when you do at least some warm-ups every day on double lip, right? So if we could try this briefly, can we all take our thumbs and we're going to put it on our, kind of on the outside of the, you know, we're going to sort of bring this in. And the very bare minimum of the lip over those top teeth, it's, it's weird to say over the top teeth because everything we do in our life is over the bottom teeth, right? So we do this and then 
Bring your phone in. All right. This is not such a big deal now, but can we try now playing an open G? Yeah, I know everyone's like, no, no, please. <laughs> see, you guys see yours? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not, you know, that we do it now, it's not that, it, doing one jumping jack isn't going to kill you. Doing 50 jumping jacks is what, is what kills you if you haven't done them, right? You know, Josephine does it. Can you show us your armature very quickly? Can you, can you play an open G? If you couldn't tell just by looking at her top lip, you could not tell that she was playing double lip. She does the bare minimum going over the top teeth, right? And most people will look at her and say, oh, she's a single lip player. And so it's one of those things you need to see a little meat, right? I would just say if you do five minutes a day, as crazy as this sounds, if you do five <coughs> minutes of a slow scale, your stamina is going to improve greatly. Your tone will improve because it's going to resonate that chamber a lot better. And you'll be able to play for longer and enjoy it more. So just a little bit of double lip in your life is great. So enjoy it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. You're great. Thank you. Hi, I am Pam Schuler. I teach at Eastern New Mexico University. Um, I'm going to share something that one of our colleagues on our committee actually shared. It was in a meeting. One of the last meetings we had, um, Ricardo, I don't know if you're tuning in or not. I had not heard this before, and since using it with students, I was like, where has this been all of my life? So if you are a teacher, for those of you that are joining us, or if you are your own teacher at home, which most of us are, we have, if, if you're a professional, you know, like you're with your orchestra so often, if you're a high school student, a college student, you're with your band so often, you're in a lesson like an hour, two hours a week, the rest of the time you are your own teacher. So this is something that I found that has been very helpful with my students. Um, a lot of times when we are instructing embouchure, we give, hopefully, we hope, fingers crossed, great information in a lesson. And the student's like, okay, I got this. And then the student will go out and practice. And we often wonder, but did they really get that? And do they have the know-all in the practice room to apply all these techniques? What Ricardo had shared with us is, again, and I love the approaches I'm hearing with like the corners. That's something when I was growing up, it was all about the bottom lip. It was never about the corners. I love this approach to the corners. One way to check in a practice room for those of you that are students or you know working in a practice room, actually turn the mouthpiece around, right? Has anyone done this before? Okay, yes, somebody's like, yes, so how do you not know this, right? So it, trying to play, and we're gonna have you do this on an open G. If there is too much tension on that reed, nothing is going to come out. So I want you to try to use this double lip embouchure that we're talking about. This is a great feed into this. Use the double lip and see if you can produce either an open G or a thumb one, two, three, C. If the sound is not being produced, we maybe need to alleviate some of the tension on that reed. And again, think about coming in from the corners and not biting down from the top and the bottom. It might be a very interesting sound. I know when I have my students do this, it's, it's very interesting for those first couple of moments, but give it a try and see how that approach might change to really getting those corners in and making sure that you're giving that reed some space to vibrate. So go ahead and try that on an open G. Interesting as a good You hear the squeaks? Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So I do hear some people as they start to play, we get that like initial squeak as we try to figure out what exactly is happening here with an embouchure. And one of the other tools that I think most of us probably use this, but for those that don't, getting into a mirror as well and trying to figure out what is this supposed to look like. So if you are a student or you're teaching high school, get your students in front of a mirror. And I say mirror, I guess I'm old school. Now everybody has like the tablets and the cell phones and the recorders and all of that stuff. So utilize the technology tools that we have. Take five minutes of your practice. And I know not all of us like to like take that five minutes every day. I don't want to hear myself. I don't want to watch myself, right? But if you take the five minutes to really focus in and zoom the camera in or really get close to the mirror and think about what's happening in terms of the chin here. Is it flat? Is it out of the way? Are those corners in? Utilize those tools that can help. If you have a passage that you're like, why is this not speaking? What's going on here? Maybe try that passage with the barrel, the mouthpiece turned around, and that can help, help open up the reed and free that sound to be able to speak and really utilize those corners. All right, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic.
fantastic. Yeah, we have a couple minutes. I'm awesome. just going to wrap up. Um, I want to speak to some of the educators out there and anybody who's not played clarinet for a while and maybe come back to clarinet. I know, even if I don't play for three days, I have some embouchure work to do. Um, and specifically, if you're, uh, maybe some of our online uh, folks are band directors dealing with young students. And I was very fortunate in elementary school, junior high, that my band director was a saxophonist and clarinetist, so he knew what to do. Um, sometimes you might have a student in a band with a trumpet player director, and they don't necessarily know what to tell uh, those section members. But my band director, he walked by me one day and he pointed to me and he said, flat chin. And I, I knew what he meant, so all of a sudden I went, whoop. Like that. But I think we need to discuss a little specifically what, what does that mean, really, flat chin? All of you clarinetists have heard that phrase before, right? Flat chin. Well, we've been talking a little bit about the upper lip, but let's talk about this, this bottom portion here. Um, specifically, let's get specific. It's not flat, really, is it? It's pulled down and away against the shape of our, our skull here, our bone structure. And so, specifically, it's concave, isn't it? Convex is when it bulges out, and concave is when it bends in just a little bit. Um, so make your best clarinet embouchure and just feel that. You should feel that little indent right there, and that's that concavity. And that's what we mean by the flat chin, really. That's so important. Um, one of my other band directors when I was really young, this is what she told all of the clarinets to do, and it was partially good and partially bad. I'm going to tell you the partially good part first. Everybody smile really big. She told all the clarinets to smile. So it's good because of the chin, right? Feel that. You automatically get that nice flat chin and that concavity. It's bad because the corners are way out. And so what I want you to do is smile and then bring those corners in like ooh, EU or OO. Or sometimes I like to think of those little claymation figures. They always have the little definite lip, O lips, right? <laughs> Mr. Bill. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, and one other thing I want to address, and you're so good. I don't know if you could come up here by our camera here and kind of do a profile view for our online viewers. Just play an open, uh, open note. And so we can show that she's got that nice, long, flat, concave chin. Go ahead and play a nice big. Yes, that is an embouchure for the ages. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if some of you can speak to this, but one of my greatest challenges as a university teacher is when a student comes to me and they don't have that embouchure, how to get them to change it and how to get them to work on it. So some of these wonderful uh, tactics that you can use, try these different methods, try the smile, try the, the finger, I really love that. Um, I've heard like think like you're drinking a really thick milkshake through a big straw, sucking in. You know, some of these uh, different ways work. Um, but just in general, I say like um, you were saying PM, slow, daily, looking in the mirror um, and not giving up. Very often it's uh, one step forward and two steps back when you're trying to establish this embouchure. But I'll just throw it out to all of you very briefly. If you have any tips for how to change someone embouchure once they've already established maybe a not so great habit. Just to add what you, to what you, were, what you were saying, one of, the, you know, one of the big issues with the embouchure is fatigue. I mean, we're dealing with, we're dealing with a lot of muscles and especially when we have to make a change. Those muscles are probably not used to doing what we want them to do. And lots of breaks, lots of checking, the mirror or whatever device you use to, to reflect on what you're doing. Uh, it's, it's so critical because we, we go back to our old habits really quickly, really, really quickly. And you, know, you, you need about three weeks before you can, you can establish a new habit. And that's kind of assuming that there's not a bad habit or a, a habit that we're trying to get rid of. Uh, so you give yourself more time and lots of breaks to minimize the fatigue. And I think the most important thing is to be patient with yourself mm -hmm. and not expect it to just, I'm going to work on publisher today and it's going to be perfect by the end of today. Because that's, that's not fair to yourself because it takes more time than that. 
anyone else want? Um, if I could really quickly, I think part of the part of the thing with Amateur, there are many method books that talk about your fingers. So many method books, I mean, it's astronomical. But when you want to really find a great book that like narrows down what a proper Amateur is, those, are, those tend to be a little harder to find, right? Because everyone is so different and so find, find texts out there that, you know, that of established teachers that really go into those things you know, I, I personally like a lot of the, um, obviously David Etheridge wrote many fine books. Larry Guy, for those of you, the New York clarinets. Larry Guy's books are, I think they're terrific, but every single method touches on embouchure briefly and then just, okay, let's get to playing notes, right? Really find those books that really get into talking about embouchure and I think that'll help you on your way. You know, there aren't many, but they're, they're very, the ones that exist are very good. So. Great. Well, just to finish up, let's have you stand up one more time in profile. And along with her, would you all play with your very best embouchures? How about we do a G scale? Everybody together, all conduct, huh? Nice and slow.